All right, future fixed income gurus, today we're diving into the deep end of bond risk and return analysis with curve-based duration and convexity measures. If you've been sticking with the basics so far, it's time to up your game. You see, when we talk about bonds with embedded options, like callable and putable bonds, or even mortgage-backed securities, MBS, traditional duration and convexity just don't cut it. Why? Because these bonds have cash flows that can change depending on interest rates. So let's explore how effective duration and effective convexity give us a better handle on these complex instruments. First up, let's talk about why we need curve-based measures for certain bonds. For vanilla bonds, those without any options, Macaulay duration and modified duration are great for estimating interest rate risk. But when bonds have embedded options, like callable or putable bonds or mortgage-backed securities, the cash flows aren't set in stone. That's where effective duration and effective convexity come into play. Effective duration measures a bond's price sensitivity to changes in a benchmark yield curve, making it more suitable for bonds with uncertain cash flows due to embedded options. It accounts for the possibility of early redemption, callable or put protection putable. This is the formula. Imagine you have a callable bond with a full price of $100.67 per par value of $100. If the government par curve shifts up by 25 basis points, the bond's price drops to $98.05, and if the curve shifts down by 25 basis points, the price increases to $101.75. Using these values, the effective duration would be 7.35. This tells you that for a 1% change in the benchmark yield curve, the bond's price would change by approximately 7.35%. Effective convexity. This measure complements effective duration by capturing the second order effect or the curvature of yield curve shifts on a bond's price. For bonds with options, effective convexity considers the non-linear response of the bond's price due to those options. This is the formula for effective convexity. All right, now let's break down how these measures play out for callable bonds, putable bonds, and even mortgage-backed securities, MBS. A callable bond allows the issuer to redeem the bond before maturity, usually when interest rates drop. This means the bondholder's potential gains are capped because the issuer is more likely to call the bond when rates are low. Effective duration of a callable bond is generally shorter than that of a non-callable bond, especially when interest rates are low, higher likelihood of being called. Now, what is negative convexity? As rates decrease, the bond price doesn't rise as much as it would without the call option. This is what we call negative convexity. Your upside is limited. Consider an environment where rates are dropping. A callable bond might see its price increase, but not as much as a similar non-callable bond. If rates drop from 5% to 3%, the callable bond's price might only increase by 5%, whereas a non-callable bond might increase by 8%. A putable bond gives the bondholder the right to sell the bond back to the issuer at par before maturity, usually when interest rates rise. This protects the investor from price declines when rates go up. Effective duration of a putable bond is shorter when rates rise higher likelihood of being put back to the issuer. Unlike callable bonds, putable bonds generally have positive convexity. As rates decrease, the bond price tends to increase more significantly. In a rising rate environment, a putable bond is like having an insurance policy. 
If rates go from 3% to 5%, the put option protects the investor, limiting the price drop. Mortgage-backed securities, abbreviated as MBS, MBS cash flows depend on refinancing activities, making effective duration and convexity particularly relevant. As rates drop, refinancing increases, causing early repayment and affecting cash flows. Convexity can swing between positive and negative based on prepayment speeds. Let's combine these measures to see how they work together when evaluating bond risk and return. This is the formula for estimating the percentage change in a bond's full price for a shift in the benchmark yield curve using effective duration and convexity. Using curve-based duration and convexity helps both issuers and investors understand the potential risk and returns of complex bonds like callable and putable bonds, or MBS. These measures provide more nuanced insights, especially in volatile or uncertain interest rate environments. Okay, let's break this down from both the issuer and investor perspectives. When we talk about curve-based interest rate risk measures, we're dealing with some seriously useful tools. They help us get a handle on how complicated securities like callable bonds and asset-backed securities react to shifts in interest rates. Now here's the deal. If you're holding a callable bond and interest rates drop, the bond's effective duration shrinks and you might even end up with negative effective convexity. Translation? The bond's price doesn't climb as much as you'd hope, but if we're dealing with putable bonds, the story flips. Higher rates mean the bond's price doesn't fall off a cliff, giving investors some built-in protection. Now let's talk limitations. First, picking the right shift in the benchmark curve is quite important, so it's not a one-size-fits-all game. Plus, pricing these complex bonds gets tricky since the models we use are based on all kinds of assumptions about how issuers or borrowers will behave when interest rates do their thing. All right, folks, we've been cruising through the world of bond duration, but now it's time to take a pit stop and explore something a bit more specific and powerful, key rate duration, KRD. Think of key rate duration as your precision tool for measuring bond price sensitivity, not just to parallel shifts in interest rates, but to changes at specific points along the yield curve. So what's the big deal? Well, if you're managing a bond portfolio or assessing the risk of a particular bond, you don't always expect the yield curve to move uniformly up or down. Sometimes short-term rates might spike up while long-term rates barely budge. That's where key rate duration comes into play. It measures the risk of these non-parallel shifts. In other words, it's all about zooming in and seeing how a bond or portfolio responds to changes at each key maturity point on the curve. Picture this. Key rate duration is like having a set of binoculars for each part of the yield curve, two-year, five-year, ten-year, you name it. Each of these key maturities has its own duration that shows how sensitive the bond's price is to changes in that specific part of the yield curve. Unlike effective duration, which looks at the entire curve as a whole, KRD breaks it down by each key rate or maturity point. The individual key rate duration for a particular key rate, say the five-year point, 
is calculated by shifting just the five-year point on the yield curve, recalculating the bond's price, and then plugging those changes into a formula that's similar to effective duration. The idea is simple. By isolating the impact of a shift at a specific point, you get a clearer picture of the risks associated with that part of the curve. Here's a cool trick. The sum of all key rate durations across different maturities equals the bond's effective duration. So while effective duration gives you a big picture, key rate durations provide a more granular, zoomed in view of where the risks lie along the curve. All right, let's get practical. Imagine you're looking at a bond portfolio and you wanna understand how it might react if the two year rate shoots up while the 10 year rate stays flat. You'd calculate the key rate duration for the two year point by shifting the two year yield, recalculating the bond's price, and then measuring the sensitivity. Repeat this for other key rates and you can see how different parts of the curve impact your portfolio differently. Suppose we have a callable bond and we're specifically interested in what happens if only the short term rates like the two year or five year points rise. Why? Because for callable bonds, the short end of the curve often determines whether the issuer will call the bond. If the short term rates rise significantly while long term rates remain stable, this could flatten the yield curve, impacting callable bond prices. If short-term rates rise sharply, the bond might experience a price drop, signaling a potential flattening of the yield curve. On the flip side, if long-term rates rise, the yield curve might steepen, affecting different bonds differently. So how do analysts and portfolio managers actually use key rate duration? Here are a few practical applications. For a bond like a callable bond, key rate duration helps predict price changes based on specific shifts in short-term rates. If short-term rates increase but longer-term rates hold steady, key rate duration can show how much of the bond's price change is due to the change in the two-year or five-year point versus the whole curve moving. If you're a portfolio manager, understanding the key rate durations of your portfolio helps you anticipate how specific segments of the yield curve might impact your overall portfolio value. You can adjust your portfolio's key rate exposures to align with your market outlook. For example, if you expect short-term rates to rise more than long-term rates, you might reduce exposure to short-term bonds or hedge that risk accordingly. If you're looking to outperform a benchmark, say an index, you could adjust the key rate durations of your portfolio based on your expectations of changes in the benchmark yield curve. By strategically positioning yourself to take advantage of expected curve movements, you can potentially enhance returns or mitigate risks. So we've just wrapped up our deep dive into portfolio duration and convexity. By now, you should be feeling pretty confident about how to calculate the weighted average duration and convexity of a portfolio. Remember, it's all about understanding the overall interest rate risk and managing it smartly. But let's be real. Real-world bond portfolios aren't always that straightforward. Not all yield curves shift perfectly in parallel, and not all bonds react the same way, right? That's where we transition to our next powerful tool, empirical duration. Here's the deal. When we talk about analytical duration, we're dealing with formulas. These calculations are great for giving us a theoretical snapshot of how bond prices should behave as interest rates change. They assume that government bond yields and credit spreads are uncorrelated. But as we all know, the real world is messier. Enter empirical duration, which uses historical data and statistical models to gauge how bonds actually behave under various market conditions. Think of it like this. Analytical duration is your standard GPS route. It assumes everything smooth sailing. But empirical duration is like the route you'd take after checking live traffic data. <laughs> 
It knows where the potholes and slowdowns are and it adjusts accordingly. Analytical duration works well with low credit risk bonds where everything is nice and stable. It uses neat formulas to estimate a bond's price sensitivity to yield changes. Empirical duration is best for high credit risk bonds. It digs into the messy realities of market behavior, considering correlations between credit spreads and benchmark yields. It gives a more nuanced picture, especially when things get chaotic, like during an economic crisis. So when to use empirical over analytical? Think back to 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the bond markets went nuts. Investors flocked to the safety of government bonds, pushing yields down. At the same time, credit spreads blew up, reflecting heightened credit risk. In these scenarios, using just analytical duration would be like navigating with an outdated map. You'd miss out on the changes in the relationship between government bond yields and credit spreads. Instead, you need empirical duration to account for these shifts. Here's the takeaway. Analytical duration gives you a ballpark, but empirical duration gets you closer to home in volatile markets. And if you're working with high credit risk bonds, empirical is the way to go. It's like having your eyes wide open versus being a little nearsighted. Now, just so we're clear on what we mean by analytical duration measures, let's recap. Approximate modified duration this is your go-to for estimating the slope of the price yield curve. It's all about understanding how much a bond's price changes with small movements in yield. Effective duration. Think of this as the MVP for bonds with embedded options. Callable, putable, you name it. It adjusts for the fact that cash flows can change, making it more flexible. Key rate duration. Now, this is for those who want to go a step further. It measures sensitivity to changes in specific maturities on the yield curve, capturing the effect of non-parallel shifts. So as you can see, both analytical and empirical approaches have their place. If you're dealing with a vanilla low-risk bond, the analytical route is often good enough, but when the market is full of surprises, like in times of crisis, Empirical duration gives you that extra edge. It helps you better navigate the bond market's twists and turns. All right, folks, keep these tools in your arsenal and know when to use each one. Stay sharp. Keep analyzing those bond markets with both the theory and the reality in mind, and you'll be ahead of the curve. Let's get ready for the next lesson.